Hello, and welcome to the latest in Fitch's series on the global economy. Today, we'll be discussing the U.S. and the global economy. My name is James McCormack, and today I'm joined by Charles Seville, head of North America Sovereigns, and Brian Colton, our chief economist. Let's get started. Brian, let's start with the growth story. I think that's the logical place to get started. So what are the growth drivers today? Where are we in the growth cycle, and how do you see growth going forward? What we have at the moment is a whole bunch of numbers being affected by the hurricanes. Um, so we've seen industrial production, we've seen job numbers, and we've seen retail sales all, all affected quite significantly. Um, but the underlying picture is actually pretty solid. Uh, the, broad, uh, the broad story is, is uh, an export and investment-led recovery. Growth in 2017, uh, about 2.1% 2, 2 is our latest forecast. That's up from 1.6% last year. Um, on the domestic demand side, uh, the investment story uh, has been led initially by, uh, by by the energy sector, but it's but it's but it's broadened beyond that, and we're fairly optimistic that it's that it's got got legs, even though the rig count is now starting to to fade a little bit. Um, and what gives us grounds for optimism is the business surveys are, are very strong, uh, and as the labour market tightens, there's more pressure for firms to employ more capa employ more investment uh, to try and get the ex the extra output that that, that they need. Up until now, it's been easy just to meet that extra output by, by hiring by hiring workers. There's, there's there's less of those there's less of those around. On the consumer side, uh, we've had a bit of a slowdown in real income growth, uh, but it's not affected consumer spending as much as we thought, and that's basically because the saving ratio has been coming down. And I think what's happening is the tightening of the labour market is is improving consumer confidence, job security is is going up. So the consumer is 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 fairly is fairly solid. It's not an improving story, but it's it's you know it's holding up pretty well. And then on the ex external side, um, yeah, really quite impressive pickup in exports this year. Um, uh, and the fact that it's been into Asia uh, and, and Latin America is telling you that the emerging market story is quite an important part of that. And, and I think the global picture is probably more important than, than the dollar. I mean, the, the dollar has weakened recently, but I don't think really you can put much of much of the exports uh, uh, story down to that. So we actually think growth is going to accelerate a bit next year. Not so much on a sequential basis from from here, but just it's just how the annual average averages are going to are going to pan out, um, but also we think that there's probably going to be a little bit of fiscal easing as well. So just on that ex external sector, do you think the rest of the world is supporting U.S. growth or is U.S. growth supporting the rest of the world growth? I think probably the, the of, of the major economies, it's probably China that's made the most difference to the world uh, in the last in the last nine to twelve months. Uh, from about the middle of 2016, China's imports really started to grow uh, quite quite substantially. If you strip out their imports, which are related to a sort of export processing, and I think that's probably been the biggest incremental change in terms of in terms of final in terms of final demand. So I'd, I'd put China at the top of the list of, of in terms of the, the global trade recovery. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Let's turn to Charles and talk a little bit about the state of public finances. Where are we with respect to public finances in the U.S. and what's our outlook in that area? Okay, well, the federal deficit reached 3.5% uh, of GDP in the fiscal year ending September 30th, and that's with the economy uh, doing pretty well. So I think when you look at what the IMF says about the U.S. fiscal stance, they, they recommend that the U.S. tightens uh, its primary balance by around 2.5% of GDP to get to a position where the debt to GDP ratio stabilizes. So, you know, what we see is that debt to GDP is, is rising and um, now we would expect the, the deficit to widen again next year and to continue widening slightly. Does that cause us any concerns from a rating perspective, the deficit uh, broadening out, the well, deficit level? The U.S. has probably more leeway than some other AAAs, um, have, faces fewer financing constraints, there's obviously a very solid demand for, for U.S. government debt. So to that extent, no, but if you compare the U.S. with other AAA countries, then it's the only one where we see a sustained rise in the U.S. debt burden uh, going forward. Okay. Um, Brian, let's come back and talk a little bit about monetary policy. There's been a lot of discussion, not just in the U.S., but globally, sort of where's the inflation? You know, inflation levels relatively low but it looks like the Fed has already begun its tightening cycle. Is it our expectation that the Fed will continue that tightening cycle, or is it dependent on data? Is the Fed on a, on a course of tightening, or, or is, it, is it data dependent, and is part of that data what happens on the inflation front? 
I, I kind of think that some uh, th there's there's new factors coming into play on the monetary policy side. I don't think it's just about narrow inflation targeting anymore. I think monetary policy settings have been pushed to such extreme levels, um, and now we're in a, a kind of a pretty good kind of global macro situation. I mean, the, the growth rates that we're seeing now, not just in the U.S. but but uh, you know in the eurozone, uh, in in, J in Japan. Um, or well above trends, so we're seeing output gaps close pretty fast if there is indeed an output gap at all. Unemployment's uh, heading, you know, sort of below the kind of lows of previous, you know, uh, previous uh, 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 peaks in the peaks in the growth cycle. So, I, I think with that with that economic backdrop, I might get the sense that the um, the, the, the policy trade-offs that, that are faced by central banks have shifted a bit over the last several years. It's, it's there's been this big concern about tightening too early. Uh, the economy goes into recession, central banks get the blame for mm. you know, snuffing out the recovery just as it's begun. Uh, and that's been a, I think that's been a really kind of, that's kind of been the, the sort of the, 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 mon the monkey on their back. I think, uh, we, I think we've moved on from that now and there's this, there's this desire I think among the central banks to normalise um, even if inflation is, is a little bit uh, below, below, below target. So I actually think it would take quite a big shock to the data, quite a big negative shock to growth and a significant downward threat to inflation expectations from here uh, to, to stop the Fed from continuing with a, with a path of gradual tightening. Now that said, we have seen a decline in core inflation uh, in 2017 that nobody really expected. And to be honest, nobody can really explain it either at the moment. Uh, there have been one or two important one-off uh, factors, a big decline in Mobile phone um, uh, subscription charges uh, in, in April is one of the big providers sort of made made a kind of step change in the way it did its pricing. I think there was a patent change on a, uh, an important some important drugs as well. So we you know we've had a few kind of what look like price level changes and, and that and that is part of it. But it kind of seemed to go a little bit beyond that. So it's it's a little bit of a mystery. And the Fed are talking about it more and more in their minutes, but. So far, they've kind of been quite prepared to sort of ignore it and, mm -hmm. and, and see right through it. And I, I think that's telling us that you know, maybe we are on a bit more of a preset course here uh, on monetary policy in terms of c continued tightening. That's certainly our view. And our forecast is for another, another rate hike in December and another three or four rate hikes next year. And on inflation itself, given that you mentioned output gaps potentially closing if there are, in fact, output gaps left. But, so would we expect to see higher inflation um, going forward? In, in the U.S., I, I, th I think we would, and uh, I don't think it will be dramatic. You know, one of the defining features of the of the of the world economy the last few years has been this sort of um, the Phillips curve doesn't seem to have been working very well. By which I mean, uh, as unemployment rose very sharply after 2009, 2010, you'd kind of expected inflation to fall a lot faster than it did, and actually it was remarkably stable. Uh, you know, we had one or two one or two months of deflation when the oil price collapsed, but then we went back to positive rates pretty quickly. So, um, on the uh, you know on on the other side of the cycle, when 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 uh, labour market was deteriorating, wage growth didn't fall very much, and as the labour market's tightened, wage growth hasn't gone up very much. That said, it's you know it's two point seven percent the latest number. It's not it's not that it's not that low. So I, I think that that flatter Phillips curve is. It's not really anything new, so I'm not sure it would really change. It would really change central banks' thinking. So I think core inflation will edge up uh, as 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 we go uh, in, into 2018, 2019. I think wage growth will head 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 to three percent uh, gradually, uh, but I, I don't think inflation is going to suddenly kind of kind of jump out of the box. But obviously that is a risk, and it's a risk that the Fed is more and more concerned about, and that plays into those trade-offs that I was talking about earlier. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the dollar, and I want to get both of your views on, on the dollar. I'll start with Brian. Um, do you see the dollar having a diminished global role in the, in the medium term? Difficult to see it in the short term, because <clears throat> these, these changes tend to take a long time, but do you see a diminished role for, for the dollar uh, in the medium term? Well, we've been getting this question a lot, as the, does the dollar's weaken this, this year? Um, but I, I think that's really uh, more about you know, where the surprise has been in the world economy. Now, the U.S. economy has kind of panned out more or less as we expected it to. It's been, it's been solid, but it's not been any better than we expected. Where the positive surprises have come have been in the eurozone, and they've been and they've been and they've been in China. And both of those currencies uh, have have appreciated as, as people have kind of been reassessing the outlook for monetary policy in both of those in both of those economies. So that's where the surprise has been. I, I don't think it's been a U.S. story this recent weakening of the dollar. Right? And I think that. For me, is you know sort of sets the scene for them to, to answer your question about the medium term. I, I don't really see uh, 
I don't really see big big threats to the, to the dollar's reserve status at this point. You know, obviously the the, the candidate, the euro and the and the, and the Chinese uh, RMB are the, are the two candidates. Um, uh, Eurozone still got still got challenges, although although you know dealing with them quite well at the moment. Um, China has actually as as they've made efforts to deal with the capital outflows over the last uh, last year or so. They've actually been sort of tightening up on the capital capital outflow controls. Um, they have actually uh, become more interventionist on on the currency uh, with the changes that were made in May to how they do the fix it, to do to do the fixing. So, I think that those measures have, have helped China's macro management. Uh, they've been part of the sort of the, the policy response, which has helped growth stabilize after two thousand and fifteen. Uh, but they have kind of come at the cost a little bit of a, of a, of a reduction in the pace of internationalization of the RMB. You know, there have been some constraints on outward FDI flows, which were, which were part of that sort of internationalization drive with the, with the Belt and Road, a, a big pickup in Chinese outward FDI. You know, they, they've, been, they've, been, um, they've been kind of restricting that a little bit because they've been worried about these balance of payments uh, pressures. So I think from, from that perspective, doesn't look to me as if there's been uh, an acceleration in, in the in the uh, in, in the potential for the for the RMB to, to replace the dollar. Okay, so Charles Brian doesn't see it as an imminent challenge. So let's go hypothetical. If there were a diminished role for the dollar, say as a reserve currency, a global reserve currency, would that have rating implications? How important is that from a rating perspective? Uh, it's pretty important as a support to the AAA rating. Um, I mean. Yes, the U.S. can issue as much as it wants, uh, and there will always be a demand because the U.S. Is, is the global reserve. The dollar is the global reserve currency, and it's still around two thirds of global reserves. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about debt. You mentioned debt levels earlier, and you mentioned it in the context of other AAA uh, sovereigns. So, how do we think about the the government debt level in the U.S. relative to its its peer group? And if you think about it sort of on a going forward basis, where would you see debt? A and also relative to the peers in, in a, on a going forward basis. Sure. The, the US general government debt, that's the measure that we tend to use to compare across countries, is 100% of GDP and it's rising. And it's really the only AAA sovereign where we see a sustained rise in the debt burden going forward. Most other AAAs are, are stabilizing their debt or or it's falling. Is there a point at which that becomes a rating concern, the debt to GDP level in and of itself for the US, or do some of these other factors like the role of the dollar and, and uh, other things sort of outweigh that concern? Yeah, I think it does uh, depend a little bit on the interaction of some of these other factors and you know we haven't set a threshold where we, we say if debt gets above this level then you know the AAA rating is at risk. Uh, but that said, we, we do over a 10-year horizon see you know, a fairly substantial rise in debt and, unless there's a sort of change in course in, in fiscal policy. And we are about to see a sort of fiscal easing in the US, we believe. And how about the debt ceiling? That's been topical in recent years. It's been topical this year uh, and maybe topical again soon. Is that something that we're interested in from, from a rating perspective? Could it, could it have rating implications? We see it as very much a tail risk that this idea that the U.S. would fail to raise the debt ceiling and and miss a payment um, that would be you know that's very much a tail risk. We we don't expect it to happen. That the other form of risk is that it somehow undermines in international investor confidence in the U.S. But uh, we haven't really seen that as a result of past uh, debt limit episodes. So as it stands, the government has is now funded until early December. Um, and we think that the federal government can continue to use extraordinary measures uh, until Q1 next year. But there's a, a lot of uncertainty about uh, how long it can continue. But bottom line is we won't see a, another debt limit uh, standoff or, or crisis until 2018. Okay. So let's close by talking about some of the risks to the outlook, maybe some downside risks and, and some upside risks as well. So Brian, when you think about the, the macro environment, the macro outlook in the U.S., uh, what do you see as uh, two or three key sort of downside risk factors that, that you're thinking about? Well, I still think we need to think about the trade, the trade risks. Um, you know, one thing that has become quite clear is that this focus of the U.S. administration on reducing bilateral, bilateral trade deficits uh, with, with countries uh, in, in, in trade in goods uh, 
is is a, is a pretty important uh, you know driver of, of 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 their approach. And you know that uh, for, for as long as that remains the attitude, you know there has to be risks that uh, that they that they run into uh, they run into. Um, um, to, to, to disputes with countries, which, you know, in a worst case scenario, could 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 end up in um, uh, in, in a sort of retaliatory uh, scenario, and that that I think would be would, would be a concern. You know, we published some research on this earlier in the year. You know, if there was uh, uh, if, the, if there was a kind of tariff war uh, and, and big negative implications in, for the U.S. and and, and the other countries in, in, involved, but that I think is still is still out there as an important risk. It's maybe not as Bigger concern as as we were uh, we were focused on last November, but some of the recent noises around the NAFTA negotiations, you know, have been sounding uh, a little bit more concerning than the, than they were uh, than they were in, in the early days. So, I think that that's that's quite an important one to watch. Okay, so let's flip it over and think about so, what some of the upside risk might be to to the outlook. What what could go better than we think? Yeah, this feels like a bit of a parallel universe. You're asking me this question. It's been so long since there's been like an upside risk kind of story that that's been, that's really been credible. It's all been about the downside for years and years and years. But I think now there are there is a, a, a genuine upside story. I think it comes from a number of angles. Well, possibly we could get more fiscal fiscal easing. I mean, there's some discussion about you know tax cuts paying for themselves. You know, if yeah. if, if, the, if, the, if the authorities were to, to, to go for that, you know, might actually be positive for growth in the short short run. I don't know what it would be about what it would mean for, for, for sovereign credit. But um, so there's a, you know on the on the fiscal side, there's def, there's definitely uh, an upside risk uh, from from what we're, from what we're assuming. Um, and then I guess I guess the other upside just comes from uh, from from the capex outlook. We've been quite cautious in our capex forecasts in the US. We've got about three and a half percent growth, similar number next year as as this year. Um, uh, but it's it's possible we're at the point in the cycle where traditionally you get you would get what's called the investment accelerator kicking in suddenly firms looking to expand their capacity and the, and the number of reasons why they might want to do that one is as I said at the beginning you know labor market's getting tighter uh, so there's a need to sort of now start using capital instead of labor at the, at the margin um, uh, but also there's you know there's more there's more optimism out about the global economy as well so you know, you, you could easily see a seven, eight percent investment growth scenario. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be out of line with with, uh, uh, with you know, sort of what's happened on on the capex side. If technology is really starting to, you know, start to change the way uh, that the world uh, is 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 is, uh, is doing business, you know, you may may even get in a situation where firms start to think that. Actually, we better do some. We better do some capex here. Otherwise, our competitors are going to be. They're going to have the new technology, and, and, and we're not. So, you know, you could you could get a change in attitude on that side, and, and that I think bring, brings potential upside. Okay, and we'll close with Charles on that uh, issue of uh, fiscal easing being an upside risk. How would you think about that? I think from the sovereign credit point of view, it depends very much on the character of the easing that we see. Um, the, the one, the plan that's circulating, uh, that's been put forward, is is basically a corporate. Uh, tax rate cut paid for by um, getting rid of a lot of exemptions but that's likely to be very difficult to do uh, politically so I think you know we expect essentially uh, you know higher deficits as a result, as a result of this uh, and of course it may have positive spillovers for investment um, but it may not be you know the, the game changer in terms of getting the US to an actually higher growth path year on year uh, I think we, we believe that, that that's a bit unlikely. Fair enough. Charles, Brian, thank you for being here today, and thank you for watching.